Honored to have a special guest, Chaz Matthew here from Attract.io. Here to talk about AI, sales, marketing, all the things. So let's jump in and sharpen the blade with the conversation. How does that sound? Absolutely. Let's get into it. Hell yeah. Cool. So just at a high level, do you want to share with people like what do you do and, and, and how do you help them? Absolutely. So yeah, my name is Shaz Matthew. I'm located in Chicago, Illinois, uh, America. And high level, what I do is I run attractai.io. Right now we're helping people do AI lead generation through YouTube and social media. So that's our main focus right now. We recently pivoted from a general AI development company where we do everything from no code to low code to coded solutions for different businesses utilizing AI. So we made that transition. And right now we're just helping people book in qualified sales calls for their B2B company through YouTube. Awesome. Awesome. Mo mostly through YouTube. I think that's kind of like the big focus, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And then we use AI in the back end and stuff we'll definitely get into uh, later on. Very cool. So what, what is it that's different about YouTube from all the other channels? Yeah. So I have a lot to speak on that. I think there is no doubt in my mind, YouTube is the best platform for lead generation. I think it's the only social media platform for one discovery to nurturing. So it's like an all in one solution. People could find you get nurtured, buy your channel and then book in a call with you uh, and you just get higher quality leads, right? If someone watches a seven minute video compared to a 60 second short, there's night and day difference between the quality of that lead and you know how much they want to work with you. So I think YouTube is just the best, most leveraged lead generation platform. What did you learn throughout that transition from trying different like no code tools and finding your way uh, to your offer? Can you like kind of describe a little bit like what it was like being on that journey? Great question. So I, I went on a pretty crazy journey in the last year. So I'm pretty much to date. So it was July 15th, 2023. I posted my first YouTube video, which is in like three days, like my YouTube anniversary, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it was a crazy journey. So I started the journey to sort of the YouTube posting to document my journey of running my AI development company or AI automation agency, as many other people know it. And along that journey, we got a lot of clients, right? And, and all over niches from real estate, tax people, people in like CPA firms, uh, more real estate content creators, right? And it was great. Like I learned a lot about process automation, development, no code tools like mate.com, Zapier, all this stuff. Um, but along the way, it got to the point where it was becoming unscalable and unenjoyable for me. So I didn't like working with a bunch of different people. It was hard to take on different projects because people wanted different things and they used different softwares. And some people were tech savvy, some were not at all. So it became unscalable for me. And in the back end, I realized like, okay, I'm booking in really highly qualified leads using YouTube. And I said, hmm, a lot of people aren't on YouTube. And the people that are, I don't think they're doing it in the right way because a lot of people worry about views and subscribers, right? We're not trying to be Mr. Beast here. We don't care about views. We just want sales calls. So that's sort of what I pivoted into because I have all the systems for it. And then I have some automations and AI stuff that sort of ties into the business I was already running. And we pivoted into sort of AI lead generation, what I like to call it, using YouTube. Very cool. So can you unpack a little bit that insight that like really just comes, and I think everybody experiences this, but someone that's like just starting their journey and doesn't understand the hole that you found yourself in when you had multiple customers, but they all wanted different things. You're like getting yeah. this uh, context switch. Can you like, uh, yeah, kind of share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So the beginner's journey is, is a funny one because I went on the same journey in the past 14, 16 months. It starts with, all right, I have no clients. So that's the pain point. I need to get clients. And then you hit a point where it's like, okay, I have too many clients and they're all over the place. So it's funny how fast that dynamic switches from like zero clients, that's your complaint, to like, okay, I have too many clients and I, it says I'm just like losing my mind. So that hole was deep, man, because, you know, these people pay you a good amount of money, in some cases like five grand to build out something and you're just slow in the delivery because you don't have systems in place, you don't have a team in place, or you're just unfamiliar with that specific industry. So again, like when we would take on a new industry, they have new tools that we've just never explored before. And with those new tools, that's new API access, that's different um, you know, technology that may or may not integrate to what we already have built before. And I like to call it like every single person we were taking on, we were starting at ground zero which is like not where you want to be. You're just doing like highly customized stuff. And sometimes it wasn't worth the money we were being paid. Um, so the hole was deep, man. We were, we were trying to like communicate, put out fires here and there. And you know, it was, it was not the most enjoyable time, but I learned a lot about systemizing, niching down. I'm um, really like enjoying what, who you serve and what you do, because if you enjoy it, then it doesn't feel like work and you could really put passion into what you're building. Nice. And then you build that like repeatable system because you're solving or a type of person 
that has been an experience in life of context. And then when you help them go from where they're at, solve that transformation, mm-hmm. you're now a lot you're, you're not more capable to repeat that process. But the next person that has that same point, pain point, they raise their hand, you're like, oh, perfect. I literally just solved this. So finding repeatable pain points from the same type of person profile, and that, that was like one of the keys to success that you figured out. Absolutely. That's huge because when you get multiple feedback mechanisms or from like saying the same people, for example, like in the recent weeks, I got the same question from different people, but we're, they were centered around a similar thing because we're like niching down to YouTube. So it was, Hey, you know, what does this statistic mean on YouTube? And I got that question multiple times. So I know that's a pain point. And one, I could spin it into a YouTube video. So that would do well, or I could just put it into the modules that we give out to our clients um, that solves that issue. Right. And that is just like a common theme. And I would not be able to like get that insight if I wasn't focusing on a specific set of people and just niching down uh, in a sense. So that was huge. Absolutely. And that niche that you've kind of centered on, how, how do you describe that avatar? Yeah. So that avatar is essentially B2B business owners, agency owners that have clients already. And I want an extra 10 to 30 sales calls a month through YouTube. So it's people that already have the experience. They have an agency uh, that you know gets good results. And they want to build like a compounding inbound lead generation system. So B2B companies and B2C, we're starting to take on more coaches, consultants, things of that nature. Got it. So it's it's like the B2B, which is a large TAM, large total adjustable market. Uh, Then you've got agencies, which kind of involve some either new startup, people that are trying to start an agency, which is service-based, very common and successful. There's a lot of of service-based businesses out there, and it's really one of the easier ones to, to get into and start to learn. And then I love how... You really try to then also layer on focus the the pain point of get more leads, but also the mechanism that you're dialed into. It's right. I, I serve this avatar, I solve this thing for them via this vehicle, which is you focus on YouTube. Yeah, having a clear offer, like you just said, niche or I guess you could say ICP, so like ideal avatar, mechanism, YouTube, and then result sales call. If you just have a clear offer and you're very confident in selling it you could scale to the moon because most offers are very complex. And that's something I was doing as well. Like I would have weird wording. I would try to essentially, I was doing too much as one would say. And I just simplified everything. So the normal person would understand it. Like, okay, I'm paying this guy for X result and this is how he's going to do it. That's pretty simple, right? And once you're able to deliver results and it's really that simple. So you don't have to overcomplicate the offer. Um, Just break it down. Like we just said, ICP mechanism that gets result. That's it. Love it. Well, what have you seen in the journey in the AI space? Like you were invited out to Dubai, you know, you've got this whole journey of first starting in AI. What's happened over the last year from your perspective and what's happening now? And maybe what what do you think that's coming down the upcoming road? Great question. So high level summary, November, 2022, uh, if you're in the AI space, a lot of people know chat GPT dropped. I was uh, in university or college, whatever you like to call it. And I sort of dropped everything. So I finished school, but mentally dropped it at that moment in time because I went all into AI. I'm like, I see no foreseeable future where this does not change the world and takes jobs from a lot of people, but also creates a lot of opportunity, right? There's a trade-off there. Um, So I sort of went all into that. And I was, I would say one of the, first people, maybe first hundred people on YouTube talking about my AI agency, right? So um, that was a huge moment that literally that one video changed everything for me. So if I never sat down and filmed that video, I would probably not be here. I would probably not have gotten invited out to Dubai. So context on that, some of the biggest AI agency owners um, that have a personal brand who went to Dubai, Liam Otley, Akil Wade, Giannis AI. If you're in the AI space, you've probably seen some of these faces. Um, and we went out there and just networked, right? And again, that's that stemmed from personal brand. So I could say bar none, biggest action I took in the last year was starting a personal brand specifically on YouTube. And then another sort of side piece to that is going all in on something I knew was going to pan out. So like AI, it's not going anywhere. And I sort of took that leap. I think if you're in a position like me, younger, on the younger side, and I had that just sort of ability to jump in, I had no hesitation and I did it. And I think that's one thing I'll never regret just going for it, you know? Dude, it takes a lot of uh, courage to just be able to like really look back and say, damn, I really just dropped out of school or I like totally pivoted my attention yeah. at like a huge pivotal moment. I mean, it's not like we've had this before. It's almost, it's in a way, you know, the transformation of the internet, right? It's almost like yeah. that level up of a, of a moment in time. 
Yeah. yeah. So what what's one of the things that you're hearing most often when you're getting on sales calls with customers? What, what's a pain thing or like I think everybody every business suffers from not having enough leads. Yeah. But is there an aspect that they're trying to solve that um, like is the type of customer that's, that's perfect for you to help? Sure. So commonalities on sales calls. Uh, I'll, first, I'll go to the AI agency stuff. So when I was running the AI agency. One of the biggest things I think we, we as AI agency or AI business owners have to understand is the general market and the general world doesn't even understand what AI is. So I'll get a lot of questions about like, how does this even work? Like high, high level questions, because when you zoom out, you know, we're in the very minority of people using this every single day. And sometimes we get caught up at our, that, that echo chamber, or eco chamber of like, all we do is talk about this stuff. So we assume everyone knows it, which is like, could not be further from the truth. So you have to start breaking this stuff down in very, very simple language. Um, so that was a huge thing I got on like AI agency calls, like when I was doing that. And now transitioning over to YouTube, lead generation stuff. Um, lead generation, everyone, again, everyone needs it. That's sort of why I went that route because every single person needs leads. It's just, a, it's a given. And the biggest thing I see there is essentially from us, like, can we guarantee these results? Will YouTube actually book in sales calls? Uh, which we'll probably get into later uh, about like guarantees and formulating an offer and stuff like that. But people just want to know that I could provide them leads because I'm assuming they've been burned in the past. Or a lot of people don't think, I had this call the other day, a lot of people don't correlate YouTube with business. They're like, oh, only kids are on here, Mr. Beast type people are on here. And they don't really see that YouTube is the second biggest search engine on the planet. And a lot of business flows through it every single day. Um, so that's another thing. It's just like a lot of people want a guarantee about YouTube and leads, at least on our end. That's what we've been seeing. Yeah. So they're not familiar with AI. They're asking like, hey, what's the missing component trying to get more leads that they're already doing? I'm assuming they're doing some type of cold email outbound yeah. or cold calling. Yeah, a lot of cold email, cold DMs, LinkedIn, like outreaches, um, stuff like that. Yeah, the lowest cost denominators for growing your business and that you've got the most control over is sending out more emails yep. and also just picking up the phone. Uh, I think <laughs> that's kind of the old adage of, just the hard work. But if you could pick up the phone and talk to thousands of people all at the same time, you know, that's what I think I've realized around YouTube and like creating content is it's like getting on a sales presentation With a thousand that people. once you put it out there yeah. is permanent representation of what you were uh, per pre presenting in a persuasive way that is helping somebody like learn something they didn't know. Uh, and just becomes like a permanent way that you can scale your sales call. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. I mean, I, I challenge people to that are getting low views on social media, whatever it may be. Say you got 300 views on a video. Okay, cool. Go look at what a room of 300 people looks like. It's a lot of people. Like that is a lot of people. And those are all unique views, you know? And that's like a big perception switch. It's like, oh man, I only got 300 views. First of all, YouTube will give you quality views. So that's good. You'll get actual people that are interested because YouTube is built to match your videos to people that you know want to see them. And two, like 300 people is a lot of people. Um, and if you frame it right, if you have good call to actions and all the stuff that we sort of teach uh, to our clients, those 300 people, maybe three of them book in a sales call and that might be worth 10 grand to your company. You know, So it's, it's, not, it's a quality over quantity game, in my opinion, for YouTube and just put into perception like, yeah, 300 views for maybe four hours of work for a video. We've gotten it down to like two hours. So like we do two hours of work to do a whole video and that might reach 300 people, which is an absolute win, like an absolute win. Yeah, that's incredible. What's your knowledge around how the YouTube algorithm works? Hmm. Great, yeah. So the YouTube algorithm, first you have to recognize it's the second biggest search engine and it's an algorithm. So if you make the right content, which we break content into a few pieces, uh, intro, which is your hook. So like get people to watch, you have your body and then you have your outro, which has your call to action. So like go here, uh, book a call, opt in, stuff like that. Uh, that's like a, the three parts, really, really simple. And then you sprinkle in social proof among it and stuff like that. But the algorithm, if you make the video right, and then thumbnail and title, two most important things on YouTube, and then hook is third. If you do all that stuff, right, you will reach your target audience because YouTube is built and predicated on the fact that it matches your video 
to your target audience. Like you just let YouTube do the heavy lifting. You just make good content like that. Those algorithms are built on billions of pieces, trillions, probably pieces of data uh, around doing that. So you let YouTube do its job. That is the algorithm. You just have to do the actual videos well, meaning thumbnail, title, hook. That's really all we focus on. Uh, and then social proof as well. If you nail that in every single video, YouTube will, will do the heavy lifting for you. How does that compare with Google's SEO results, right? Like you've got the comparison, if you can lay it up, of if you go search for a pain point, how to get more leads on Google, you're going to see a lack of pictures, but you're going to have these links up at the top. And then these are going to be competed against by very massive amounts of resources to maintain that top ranking list. And that's all dynamically changing. And then compared to the YouTube algorithm of you can create that thumbnail, the title uh, of the thumbnail. And then if somebody clicks it, there's some text as well as the intro body and the outro, like you just said. Is there any insights around that comparison or that value opportunity cost going after either SEO on Google or SEO in a way on YouTube? That's an awesome question. And to break that down, one, Google, if I'm not mistaken, owns YouTube. So if we've actually had, and this is insane to me, and we're trying to get better at this, but if you go into your YouTube videos and you go into analytics, about 6% of our views, I believe right now are coming from Google. So meaning someone like types a question and then our YouTube video is popping up, which is insane. Wow. Like it's pretty crazy because YouTube or Google owns YouTube and it will push out videos. So if you ever looked like a like sometimes I have to change a light bulb in my house or I have to change batteries in a remote and you look that up on Google, a YouTube video will pop up, right? So those things are interlinked, first of all. And second of all, I think there's a huge dynamic and shift from Google search to YouTube search simply because more people are visual learners than like blog readers. Um, and I think that's a huge thing. Like people want to see other people break something down, talk to them. They want to see visuals and case studies and edits and b-roll and they want to see that and they don't want to read an article on how to generate more leads i think that's a huge shift especially you know as more business owners are younger i think the younger generation i mean we just want to see stuff instead of read stuff it's just the way it is um so i think that's a huge shift that people are going more to youtube with these questions than than they're going to to google and then overall you can't go wrong with either because both are pulling in billions of monthly searches on both google and youtube um so i think either or is good it depends on your business and it really depends on if your ideal client is online. So if your ideal client, if you're running like a uh, super high ticket, like oil company, right? And you're selling like oil equipment to other, like you're not going to post on YouTube because your ideal clients aren't there. That's why you might want to do the SEO route um, and then go on Google. But if you have an ICP that's even online a little bit a day, I think it's, it's a no brainer to be on YouTube. Yeah. And I think another thought that comes to mind is if you create a new domain website, right? And you... Uh, end up creating a blog and your domain name and you're trying to rank for uh, some type of service, uh, let's say dental, dental service for whatever reason, you're, no, you're, you're never going to get to the top ranked nationally for a search result on right. dental uh, capacity, right? Or dental services. But if you make a video on that and you put it on YouTube, the algorithm will actually try presenting it to an ideal avatar that's been searching recently or just so happens that made some click on Google and now they they might next click based on the algorithm's prediction on, I need to go find a dentist. Like I just typed in like yellow teeth stain. Oh, well maybe now I might be served up a YouTube video. Yeah. And so on YouTube, it's almost like a more of a democratization of you can start a channel you can make videos and then you do get a shot at being at the top of the list much more than on Google. Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned that because another point I wanted to touch on was on on YouTube. Yeah, it's much easier to rank there. And if you think about the difference of just like numbers wise, so I, I treat our clients like if you make YouTube videos and you make them in the right way, you're instantly above 99% of the other people because on YouTube, like not many people on there, right? And it's just social proof to the max because you're getting on camera and you're talking about that. And that's something I think YouTube will be the last remaining social media because written stuff like on Twitter, LinkedIn, I already know people that their whole Twitter is just AI. It's just AI writing. And you really cannot tell like the fine tuned models. You can't tell. And those are just blowing up and those are just automated. So LinkedIn and Twitter AI compromise might want to say, um, I still love the platforms, but the written content is, is much easier to mass produce 
which makes YouTube that much more valuable because you can't make a good videos with AI. Like you can't have this conversation all be AI generated yet, right? And I think it'll be one of the last platforms, like long, long form videos um, that gets replaced by AI. I think Instagram shorts are um, more, or short form is more replaceable than long form. So that's another thing. It's just getting on YouTube now and just putting yourself in front of the camera is separating you from the masses in your industry, 100%. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's just long-term lead generation like you you know your business is around trying to help people get on youtube because it's so profitable in the terms of it's going to be permanently out there um there's all these things that you just mentioned like it's the last forefront beyond what ai is going to be capable of doing we'll see what happens in the coming years uh and there's just so many people that search for problems that want something more explained than having to like sit through and read on like a uh on an SEO result or a blog. Hmm. Let me ask you this. What about the AI space? And let's talk about that pipeline that you're seeing people effectively replace their whole Twitter content strategy with AI. Is there anything you can talk on about that? Sure. So that's actually something we have in development and we like to call it an efficiency play. So right now, AI is really good. So like those fine-tuned models, can they be 100% automated? Absolutely. Are they hard to build? Yes, they're on the harder side to build, right? But they work. Like I know some people in the industry that you cannot tell it's AI, but they don't even touch their Twitter and just blows up automatically for them. But what we do is we make what we like to call like 90% machine, which is AI, and then 10% human, which is you. So our efficiency play is just creating these structured tweets that take 30 to 60 seconds to edit, put your own brand voice in it, make an edit here and there, and then post. So it's an efficiency play, right? It just gets you the frameworks of a good tweet and something that sounds like you. You get to review it, and then you get to post it. So it's not all AI. You have your control because you want the finite mix of efficiency of AI plus conversions, right? And we we don't think right now that AI is capable of like making those conversions at a high level, and you still need to have some human in the loop as you would say, to just read over really quickly, maybe add a few words here, make it sound like them, and then send it in. But you're still reducing the time it takes to write a whole tweet by 80, 90%. So it's an efficiency play. So instead of writing 10 tweets in an hour, I don't, I don't know the metrics there, you could write 20 or you could write 30, right? So it's just more volume. That's what that's what AI is, is there for, it's efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I was experimenting. Um, I've got a successful custom GPT that I can just kind of take some voice recordings as I'm out about thinking about content. If I have some thought that comes to mind, voice record myself and then upload it into a GPT that it kind of builds some familiarity with my, my voice and context. Yep. And then there's ways you can pipe that or, or just ask and prompt it like, Hey, like what would be a good social post that kind of comes out of this? And I think it's just incredible. Like it's incredible. Like just something simple like that, what you can do. And then there's even more you know, like plugins or there's like bigger pipes that you can build. I mean, that's where like that, you know, working with a consultant or like somebody that's doing these and asking some of those hard questions, like yeah. you, you can find solutions out there that you might not be using yet. Absolutely. Yeah. The GPTs are huge. It's one of the biggest things I use every single day. I know we are going to get into like, what's the biggest use case of AI in your life? GPTs. Cause you could have an army of GPTs and they're essentially your mini consultants that are trained on what you know. And it's so easy to go ask a question and it gives you a, like a pretty solid answer if you prompt it right. So GPTs, yeah, they're game changing, man. That's an awesome idea. I might, I might have to do that after this. <laughs> what are some other AI tools or, or advances recently that have come out that you that you've seen and noticed and and thought were like, wow, like this really like this was impressive. Sure. So the AI calling stuff is huge. So we work with some clients in the AI calling space, and I just know some guys in the industry, and it's getting crazy over there. Where you know you could essentially replace customer service with AI. The latency is getting down to where it's like answering instantly. It's answering accurately. So I think voice AI is one of the biggest, going to be one of the bigger disruptions. And then this sort of flopped. I thought it'd be bigger, but OpenAI released, or not, I don't know if they have released it honestly, but they like hinted at Sora, which is like their text to video platform, which looked like crazy. Like you can't tell that some of these images are AI generated. That's going to be a huge disruption. That's probably the most scary thing. It's like, you can't tell what's real anymore. Um, but I think those really blew my mind, like bland AI, Vappy, like, but those are voice AI platforms. Those are, those are crushing it. Those are really cool. And then whenever the first real text to video comes out where it like, it works really well, it's going to change all the industries from like filmmaking, like Netflix, all this stuff. It's gonna be insane. 
Yeah, so we got got some massive capabilities still in the forefront, though, right? I feel like yeah. we're almost there. Uh, I don't know how long it, it, you know we're gonna take for like Sora, but I have been seeing like the text to images. For some reason, AI still is not good at like spelling and stuff like that. Spelling is yeah. always off, and they like kind of throw some like weird spelling words. You're like, wait, what is this? Like Russian or like some gibberish that it yeah, looks yeah. like? I'm like, I can't read this. Um, but man, it's getting better and better. I think I was trying the uh, the Google. There was like a new Google model. And even though it wasn't doing good with the spelling, it was producing some really interesting images, um, better than what I was getting from Dolly because I was building this kind of presentation. And I was like, wow, like, you know, here we are in July of 24, uh, you know, where we're going to be next year. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? And it's funny how sort of like familiar people get. So like GPT drop and it blows everyone's mind for like two, three months. And then people start complaining like, oh, it spelled this wrong, this wrong. So people like humans get to get so used to stuff so quickly when, you know, realistically three years ago, this stuff was in infancy behind the scenes. Right. So, I mean, yeah, it's growing at a crazy rate. Can you talk about some of the YouTube strategy, like things that you're seeing uh, working that was working before or now isn't working or things that are getting better, like anything on the YouTube side? Yeah. So one big insight we've seen is more raw content. So if you go to my channel, the Shaz M, just basically put my name in there, you could see that all of my content is no edits, right to the point of value. So I use like uh, documents, presentations, uh, Gamma, Miro, those are like the specific softwares. And I just go right into the value of like what works, like what I'm talking about in that video. And those do really well because again, if they pull a few hundred views, those people are very qualified because they're listening to that whole like value spiel essentially what we transition from is this hyper edited content where it's like flashes and clicks and you know all this stuff uh flashing around on the screen that still works don't get me wrong but i've seen a huge transition into just more raw value i think people want to slow down i think like the pendulum always swings right so we got so far to like the clippy short form like editing stuff that's swinging back to people just want to chill and watch the video and you know just get absorb the value without like these sound effects and AI images and the AI voices popping up. So I think that's a, a huge thing we've seen. Um, either or, um, you know, they both still work, but that's a huge shift from more uh, raw content now that used to be more just hyper edited content. Yeah, yeah. I think I've actually even also uh, purchased a whiteboard that should be coming because um, I've seen a lot of people do that. It's either like the Miro online uh, or something maybe on an iPad, yeah. and then you've got. The other option is you have a whole physical whiteboard or like some type of thing you can draw on. Just as simple, like make it less uh, techy as you're saying, and kind of just bring it back to the basics. Absolutely, I think people are starting to equate the the techy, flashy stuff with like these gurus, and people don't like that word, and people don't like those people. Uh, so I think they just want to sort of be more relatable. Like, oh, this is guy with this whiteboard. He's going to break down how to post on YouTube and make money. Like, that's pretty simple. So I, I see why it's swung back that way. Yeah. I can see the audience uh, like enjoying that that form of content. Absolutely. What about A/B testing? How are you deploying that in your YouTube strategy? So A/B testing, YouTube just released the features on the thumbnails front for A/B testing. So you can now upload three thumbnails per video, and it will sort of auto test for you. I don't have concrete results on that yet. I've heard some people say it's hurting your videos. I've heard some people say it doesn't matter. Um, on the click-throughs of my three thumbnails, I did it for one video so far, they were relatively all the same. I think they're in 0.01% of each other, so didn't make too much of a difference so far. Uh, so on that front, that's what we're doing. And then on like the actual video front, we always test out new um, hooks and new call to actions. Just to, because again, the hook is a huge, the biggest thing. If you could have value from, so you make a 30 minute video, value could be from minute two to minute 30. But if you don't nail this first two minutes, no one gets that far. Uh, so hooks are a huge thing. We try to hook in the audience either in a visual manner with something I say, with like a promise that I'll get to at the end of the video. So hooks were always sort of a b testing sort of and we're trying to get better at tracking the results of that and then call to actions as well so do i mention uh, a free strategy session do i say dm me on instagram do i say opt in so just like what's the best call to action that one gets people to to click and two actually converts into money so those are always things that we're testing yeah well, i haven't tried the thumbnails i'm about to on the next video so I'll also i'm curious like what the results are going to be like there but when you come to the YouTube like whole funnel of 
ideation, scripting, shooting, video, editing, thumbnails. Like there's so much in here. There is. Yeah. Um, how do you approach that? And like, what's the time that you feel like it takes to do each one of these successfully? So yeah, YouTube is huge. And this is like in the program we release to our clients. It's just organizing your thoughts. So we just have a 10 step process. It's simple. If you want to post a video, you go in there, you follow each step to a T and then you post. Um, so just having systems, I guess that's the word, right? Systems in place to organize your thoughts because it's very easy to get overwhelmed, right? So you have the idea first or, you know, God forbid you record first and then make the thumbnail. Like there's like, there's an order you should do stuff in because, you know, it just gets out of hand pretty quickly if you don't do an order. And this all comes with testing. Like I didn't hop on YouTube a year ago and have it down. I was like losing my mind at a point, which is why I systemized everything. And then now it works, works much better. So like by the time the video is recorded, boom, the thumbnail's ready from my guy. I put it there and it's ready to post. So right now we have it down because I do more raw style content where it's literally um, running the five figure agency with myself in a video editor. That's all I need right now. And it's just two hours for us to post. So I have the idea. It takes me about an hour like to break it down. I got the idea. I break it or I write the actual script, which is like the Miro document, the Gamma document, the Google Doc. That takes about an hour. That's the, like the, the brunt of it because I want to make sure it looks nice. I want to make sure it like actually makes sense. Um, so that's like the most of it. It takes me about 30 minutes to film, 30 minutes to edit, and then post. I have like pretty much all my descriptions and keywords and stuff um, dialed in. So that doesn't take long. And then the thumbnail is ready for me when I'm ready to post. So it's about two hours in total, maybe, maybe three at most. Awesome. Do you have a custom hook strategy? How, how do you explore or document that or, or get people to, to want to watch more than just the first two minutes? Great, great question. So what we like to call that is confirming the click. I've heard a lot of people say that it's like confirming the click or validating the idea. So if your video is how to make money online, right? That's like your video title. In the first like 10 seconds, you should say, in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how to make money online and then go into social proof. Like you should literally, the thumbnail and the title should instantly be met as soon as the video starts. See, I see a lot of people that we work with and sort of correct their strategies. Like they start like, okay, let me introduce myself. Hey, my name is XYZ, I help XYZ. Well, no one, no one cares, you know? They just wanna make sure that they clicked on the right video and that they're going to actually get the value that they clicked on the video for. So you have to max, match the expectation as soon as the video starts or people will leave and people will, will leave regardless. Like I'm looking at my channel and you know, 50% of the audience is leaving after like two, three, two minutes around. So people click off regardless that you can't stop them, but you want to make sure as many people obviously watch the video because if they get two minutes in, they're more likely to get 10 minutes in and, and finish the video. Yeah. <clears throat> it's all about just stacking the content and then getting the viewers to opt into your first video subscribe and then they're they're going to get notified every time a new video comes out yeah. and then you just have this whole uh kind of brand that evolves i i think that's the cool thing is like when you can see the long tail uh look back like i looked at your channel it's like wow you have all these videos right and it's like oh my gosh like shaz you've done like countless hours like dude you're the expert on this like you you've yeah. done this over and over again um, and I think that's just such a visual wall of authority that, that comes about. Absolutely. And that's what we call the, we call it the AI YouTube funnel. We call it a compounding system because again, I have videos from over a year ago, last year that are still making me money essentially because I did it once. And then people watched the video I posted last week that somehow funnels them to the video I posted six months ago, that funnels them to the video I posted eight months ago. And they just watch it like while I sleep, while I work on other stuff. And it just literally compounds in the background. And the golden rule, I forgot who came up with this, is the seven hour rule where if people watch on average about like seven hours of long form content, they're much more likely to buy from you. Um, that's like, that's not exactly what the rule is, but it's like around seven hours ish is when people become like super, super nurtured to if they're looking for the solution you sell, they will most likely buy from you. So reaching that point might take, you know, 10, 20 videos, but again, it just builds up in the background and it builds insane social proof. Like you said. Yeah. How do you spot a good offer when clients come to you? Are you advising them on like tipping point differences that they can make in their offer? Or how do you spot like one that really stands out? Yeah. So when we sign on clients, we basically do a full audit of channel. We give them advice on offers and we give them advice on conversion mechanisms, which are landing pages, opt-in pages, stuff like that. Because, you know, you could have the best channel, but if you're sending traffic to a dead page, nothing's going to happen. So that's sort of like the high level overview of what we do. 
Um, and in terms of offers, what makes a good offer, hands down, is that you could guarantee a result and you have social proof to tell people you've done it before. That is it, right? If I go to you and I've dropped a lot of money on coaching on a sales calls because a guy will say, hey, I will guarantee you this result and I did it for X, Y, and Z person. I did it for him and her and him and her and him, right? That are in your industry. So I'm like, all right, he knows what he's doing. He guarantees me the result. And I know these other people that worked with him and got a result. So that's social proof. I think social proof is the biggest, biggest thing. Like trust, social proof will, you, because if no one trusts you, no one was going to hand money to you, right? And trust comes from social proof. So I think a good offer is you could guarantee a result and then you have content assets online and you have some type of case studies where it's like, hey, I've done this before. I'm not going to take your money and run. Well said. What other forms of marketing are you driving to your offer beyond just YouTube? Sure. So on YouTube right now is our main thing. And then we're also on Twitter, Instagram, and that is it. So it's all inbound and referrals. Referrals are huge because you know, you're good at what you do. People will naturally refer you and then you give them some incentive to refer you, et cetera. But right now it's all inbound. We haven't done any SEO. We haven't done any ads yet. Um, I, I'm pretty big on ads. I think if you can nail the skill of ads, you'll always make money. Cause if you could spend $1 and make two, then you could, you know, pretty much print infinite money. Um, as long as the margins work out and stuff. So, but we're all inbound content at the moment. We're going to also roll out outbound in the future, probably LinkedIn automated outreach to start with. Do you know of any differences that you've picked up between the algorithms on YouTube to Twitter to Instagram that you've been seeing? Yes. So YouTube, we've sort of nailed it there. So I'm going to talk about the other platforms. Twitter, your post dies fairly quickly. So Twitter is something that I think the lifespan of your post is like 10 minutes or something where like the algorithm will push it out and then it's sort of dead in the water after that. So you really have to hit it big and it takes off and people like it, retweet it, and, and it you know, sort of flies. So Twitter is hard to grow on. That for me is just going to be where I build a brand and start outreaching on Twitter as well. And that's just fun. Like I'll just pop in there and say something I'm feeling and, and then post it. It's like, it's not that serious, right? Where on the other hand, you have YouTube, which is the longest lifespan. Like the video will live for a few years if you do it right, right? Uh, it's an evergreen video. And then Instagram. So another thing with these inbound platforms is you have to look at the quality of the leads. So YouTube quality lead high. Twitter, I would also say pretty high. Twitter is also a great place to hire people. I learned. I just made like a job post and got like 50 responses, which is which was crazy. But Instagram is good for more B2C than B2B. Uh, B2C would meaning would be like coaching, consultants, more guru type people, I guess. I hate to use that word, but that is what Instagram is for. And it attracts those type of audiences, right? So in B2B space, we don't see many uh sales through Instagram because the audience for us is more on the younger side and they usually don't have a big budget. So that's what we've seen from Instagram. What I do use Instagram for is every single day I'm posting a story that has some type of social proof. It's so like a win from a client, um, what I'm doing, what I'm eating for lunch, just so people could keep up with me and like know I'm a human being and like be relatable. That's what I'm using Instagram for just to build trust and then send people straight to YouTube. That, that's it. Awesome. You mentioned um, you made a job post on Twitter and you found like a whole bunch of responses. Is that how you found your video editor or some of the team members that have joined your your creative team? Yeah, so actually YouTube found me pretty much all my team, but Twitter was just like, I was like, hey, I need a, a thumbnail editor. And I got like 50 responses. So if you need someone, then I would go to Twitter. I didn't hire anyone there. I actually might do so later in the week. But another thing about YouTube is like, I know people that have met business partners from YouTube, um, affiliate partners, team members, co-founders from YouTube, because again, it's like a high quality people that you're attracting and not everyone wants to buy with you, but some people just want to help you out and work with you. So that's another like sort of aspect of YouTube, which is uh, beneficial. Yeah, definitely. Have you tried Upwork? Upwork, I have. Um, so I found my main developer when I was running my AI agency and, and we're still doing that. So I'm still working with them. I found him through Upwork. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah. it's pretty quality. I think you get quality people uh, you just have to qualify them pretty well. Yeah. I think it'd be easier to like see some of the history work of someone on Upwork versus like responding to like 50 people on Twitter. Twitter and, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot there to go through. How do you structure your day for success? Yeah. So this is something I've been working on for a long time because. I was always torn in between like getting up early and going to bed late. I'm a big like late night guy, just like grind till like two in the morning, three, but I don't think it's a way to do it. And I've been waking up earlier and I've just been putting myself in an environment 
that it will cultivate success. I'll talk about that. Then I'll talk about my actual schedule. So first of all, it's just like set up your room in a manner or your office in a manner where you could get work done. So I close the blinds. I put my phone the furthest po- like possible way, like point from my bed. So I can't be on my phone at night. Um, I do all this stuff. So like optimizes me for like work. Like I have to work because I it's set up to do so. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is my legit schedule. The biggest sort of change I made is my sales call calendar is just 12 to five every single day. And we might honestly change that. Uh, I might cut off a day to like consolidate it. But so from like eight to 12, I could get that deep work in and stuff that has to be done. And then from five to the rest of the day, I could do more chill stuff. So like, you know, maybe respond to emails that came through, maybe send out like review videos to clients or script out the next video. But from 12 to five is all the sales calls, which we're taking maybe two, three a day, depending on like the busyness. And then from eight to 12, I'm working on the stuff that has to get done. Cause when I wake up, hop a little shower or put some water in my face, grab a coffee and just get, get to go, get to, get to working. So that's like sort of yeah. how I my day. What time do you wake up? Right now I'm waking up around, around eight, nothing crazy at all. Yeah. Cause it, you've noticed over time that you're actually better performing at night. So you do actually kind of move your sliding scale. Some, some people are like, no, you got to wake up at 4 a.m. Like if you're not yeah, waking right. up at four, what are you yeah, doing? Right. <laughs> my advice on that is just, just do you. I and mean, we're all human. We're all different. Like literally we're all different. So just test out. And if you want to work, I, I say like the early bird gets the worm, but the hungry bird gets to keep it. So like if I work up at four and you wake up at 11, but you put more work in, then you're going to get further. Like it doesn't matter when you wake up necessarily. There's definitely science behind like waking up early. I was a biology major. So you know I have a little insight into that, but it's not the end of the world. If you wake up late, just make sure you're actually putting in work, you know? Yeah. I think like if you block out your, your calendar, like you do, right? Like you're eight to 12, you get up, like you got to smash that coffee. I'm a believer in just hitting caffeine, like right off the bat. Yeah, me too. Um, I even remember like Huberman for a time was like, you know, you should really wake up and you should like not touch caffeine for sunlight. an hour and a half, go get sunlight, which I'm a proponent of. Yeah. I heard him recently on something. He was like, you know what? But I got to tell you guys, I literally wake up and splash my face with caffeine. <laughs> and yeah, I get the deep work. <laughs> yeah, right. The deep work, like the coffee in the morning. And then another thing I do from like a biological side, I just don't eat until I'm really hungry, which is like 12 or 1. So I eat like really late in the day because when I'm hungry, I just, I'm just locked in, you know? Yeah, I noticed that too. If you can stay uh, fasted in the morning till like 12, yeah, 12 12. Inch, push it back to one. Like that's solid time for deep work. Um, and then you're, you're just operating. You're thinking a lot better. And I not to do carbs. You know, what I've noticed is if I can just, you know, if I very light carb at lunch or wait all the way to the end of the day, end of the day to like smash some carbs and get that in. Yeah. Big, heavy breakfast never did well with me. I never was a breakfast guy. I felt like sluggish and stuff, maybe an apple, yeah. something an orange in the morning, but yeah, I just really don't eat in the morning anymore. And I feel like it, I work much better. Yeah. I agree. No, I do take a protein shake in the morning. So I do okay. do that. Something like that. I'm just a little bit just to give my brain something, but then nothing until lunchtime and then carbs are heavy at the, at the end of the day. Yep. That sounds about right. What's been the value of mentors that have uh, been in your life that have changed your mindset? Great question. So the AI mastermind in Dubai was like the first time I had in-person mentorship. And I consider myself lucky or lucky in the sense where I had the balls to post on YouTube one day and just had the intuition to do so. And all of those people found me. So I never really outreached for a mentor or asked for a mentor, but it sort of just fell in my lap because I built my personal brand. Uh, and it, it was crazy. It was like one day I just got a, a DM from one of the popular guys in the space saying, yo, love your YouTube videos. We're trying to form a group. Do you want to join? And I was like, hell yeah, I want to join. So I joined and then we end up meeting in person. And then the dude, the value there was insane. Not from a like from a business standpoint and funnels and strategy, yes, but from a mentality of like how much money is out there. I'm talking about people making six figures a month, people doing 10k days, like something I haven't done before, and, and I'm on the track to do. The mentality was crazy, and then just being in Dubai, like cars and money and watches and stuff. It was just like eye opening menta- mentality wise, where it's like there's so much room for growth, um, and having that abundance mindset was a, a lot of people had that, and that's something I'm trying to get better at. Because it's really easy to sort of get into this, especially with AI, you get into this doomsday frame of like, oh man, I'm not going to have a job. We're all going to be on like universal basic income. But I mean, you know, if it happens, it happens, but you have to think about how much opportunity there is. And that's something I've been like, literally when I got back from Dubai, the new offer, we scaled to five figures in like six weeks, like from the point I got back 
to now. Like that's how fast it happened. So like that really made a, a change on everything I've done. Yeah. Getting into a new environment, you know, going all the way over there being with all those, you know, different business leaders and yeah. learning from them. And what a huge takeaway It was awesome. when you saw and learned from everybody, is there, is there like an offer that you saw them all serving or like, what was the best offer that, that you saw performing in the market or maybe, maybe a couple that come to mind? Sure. So commonalities, I actually have a video dropping this week about like five things that every single person sort of had. One thing I'll touch on is everyone there, this is basic, had a personal brand. So that's not an offer, but that's just a characteristic that everyone in the room had a personal brand. Two, offers were, I'm going to sort of like counter that point in the way where we were all under the space of AI, some people in the same space. So a lot of people there were doing AI calling. A lot of people there were doing like AI agent work or, or software development. And those are like common points, but I think we, sometimes we tend to feel like oversaturation is a thing, but we were mentioning there was 12 people in that room and we could have 12 rooms of 12 people. And that's, we could all be competing in the same niche and we still would have room to grow. So if every single person in that room, there's 12 of us was doing the exact same thing, targeting the exact same people, we could all still make money. Like the, the, the market is massive. The market is massive. So the offer is what you're good at. Like, I think if you have something that you're good at under the roof of AI, you could do it no matter how many other people are doing it. If you're good at it, you could scale it. And then common offers would be like AI calling solutions was a, was a massive one. And that was probably the biggest one, honestly, just AI calling solutions. Yeah. Awesome. What's been the biggest surprise since you've started experiencing success? Yeah. Um, good question. I think biggest surprise would be how fast it comes. So like you'll be struggling for a while, a while, a while, and boom, just like, Oh, man, I just made a bunch of money. Like I've never made this much money before. So it all happens really quickly. And it takes one tweak. One video goes viral. You change wording in your copywriting or you change your hooks or you change your service delivery or your team and it all just clicks, right? So it's like, it's like um, exponential, right? You sort of just, you're going at this steady rate, steady rate and then boom, one day it just like takes off and then you, you look back, it's like, that just all came upon me really, really quickly. That's sort of what happens with success. That's why I'm a big proponent. You literally cannot fail if you just don't quit. So if you just don't quit and you have like half a brain and you have work ethic, you'll be fine. You just can't quit. You respect that a lot. Yeah. That's, that's the grind, man. You got to yeah, say absolutely. sharpen the blade. Yes, sir. Outstanding. So here, I think we've gone through a couple of the questions. I want to do like a, like a shotgun approach where I've got a few questions, just going to fire them off and just like quick answer, whatever comes to mind. Let's do it. Cool. What's the one thing you want people to take away that they learn from this? Build a personal brand. What's the most impactful lesson you've learned this past year? I would say what I just said is that if you don't quit, you can't lose. What book do you recommend the most to read? The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. How many hours of sleep do you get every night? Six to seven. What software tool can you not live without? OpenAI and Notion. And one more, what's the single biggest shift happening next year in AI? Fully autonomous agents that don't need human beings. Dude, Shaz, you've been phenomenal. This has been a, a huge piece of content. I mean, what an adventure. We explored a lot on this pod. I've learned a lot. And I think if, if anybody here is listening uh, here, the king of YouTube strategy. If you're looking for more leads and someone to help you with your brand, uh, I think Shaz Matthew has got an incredible product and a system that can help drive a lot of shortcuts that you might be wasting time with. And uh, I highly recommend as be somebody that you can work with and learn a lot from. Absolutely. Yeah. Come work with me. Shaz Matthew on all platforms and I'll see you there. Cool. Anything else that they, they can find you at any other ways to reach you? Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, uh, DM me on Instagram. I answer all of them um, and I'll answer your questions. So it's just Shaz Matthew, the Shaz M. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to you there. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on here, Shaz. Absolutely, bro. Thanks for having me.